Evening everyone. Uh, so I thought we would have a little catch up with the many incompetencies of the Home Secretary Swella Braverman today because the latest fiasco over the Bibby Stockholm plague barge, well, I was calling it an asylum barge up to now, no it's a plague barge, is just the latest. Uh, I want to run down a little bit of a charge sheet and these are, bear in mind, there's actually quite a lot. If you were to list all the cock-ups, and she hasn't been Home Secretary really for all that long, remember. She only took over last September, so she's not even been Home Secretary for a year. She's already been sacked as Home Secretary, then reinstated a few days later. But if we go down it, so first of all, what was she sacked for? Compromising national security by using personal emails to transmit sensitive information. Um, she has committed large sums of money on the Rwanda scheme, which had no chance of success by any of the metrics she was trying to achieve. Uh, and, and that is, a, that is incompetence as well. That, and I know she's also doing it to stoke culture wars, but it is also incompetence if she is aiming to do a thing and can't do it. It really doesn't matter whether for her, the Rwanda scheme is designed to act as a deterrent for uh, refugees, which of course it is not going to do. It doesn't matter whether that is the purpose or whether she knows that's not going to happen and the purpose was really just to try and create a wedge issue that will help the Conservatives at the election or help her personally because it's failing on every front. The Conservatives are looking utterly ridiculous. She personally is. So let us imagine that Swella Braverman actually becomes the next leader of the Conservative Party. The public already realise she's utterly incompetent. And imagine how much more on show her incompetence will be if she's made leader. She'll be leader of the opposition, but nonetheless leader of her party. Um, she failed in terms of the barge. There were multiple cock-ups there. She failed to make sure it was safe before putting people on board. So what's happened, uh, for those who aren't aware, well, I'm sure you are, um, it was, I mean, public health officers have been going, well, it's ridiculous. If you've got water that's been left standing in pipes, you need to test it for things like Legionnaire's disease before you let anyone in. And of, of course, it's a barge that hasn't been in active use for a little while. So of course, it's had standing water there. Of course, you would test for Legionnaire's disease. And they did do. The Home Office actually tested for it. They just didn't wait for the results. Now, in terms of process... What's happened is someone has said that you can move people onto the barge before those results have come back. Someone has signed off on that. Someone has made that decision. And it doesn't matter whether it was Braverman personally or someone else. She has created the culture by which that can happen. Um, she, there was also then the situation when the lab results came back and it was like, yeah, there's Legionnaire's disease there. Um, she, or the Home Office, shall we say, carried on putting people on board instead of immediately taking them off. Now, I don't think they did that deliberately. I think that's just a cock up. I think it's because the, um, the lines of communication are so bungled that it took a very long time for the message that there was Legionella present to get through. Um, but those are, you know, that's the big news. There's other things as well. Uh, Robert Jenrick, who's a minister under her, he's the immigration minister, so she, he's in her department. He left his ministerial case unattended on a train for several minutes. Someone took a photo of it. They could have stolen it. Granted, I think it would be a bit foolish to steal it because there's bound to be CCTV around train stations. You would be identified. They are quite distinctive. But in theory, someone could have stolen it. And if they had something to cover it up, may have been able to, to get away with it. But nonetheless, he left it there. No action seems to have been taken. That would have been down to her to discipline him. Um, there's been a, a, a theft. So there's a, there's a base in Kent, which is the base of operations for drones uh, active over the channel. Obviously, they're recording people coming across on the boat in order to try and identify um the the people smugglers so that they can they can target them okay as you as i'm sure you you're aware um it was broken into that base was broken into and a load of fuel was stolen 
as well as a hard drive that was in a safe, a hard drive containing all the recordings, all these drone recordings. And it was targeted. And how did they break in? Was it a sophisticated operation? No, they climbed over a fence and cut through some tarpaulin with a knife. They had a knife and legs. That is how they got in. Um, the report said that it was likely an inside job because they must have known there'd be no one in the hangar at the time they targeted it. But then isn't that um, a vetting issue for the Home Office as well? Are they vetting people properly who are working on that uh, base? And then the final one, before I come to some comments, the Foreign Office has had a cyber attack. And you think, well, that's the Foreign Office, that's not Bradman. But security is the Home Office's job. And you think to yourself, well, attacks will take, you know, uh, there was a cyber attack um, by, or uh, allegedly by Russia and China, or one of the two. And you think to yourself, well, these attacks are likely to happen. Is it definitely the Home Secretary's fault? And it's like, you have to think to yourself, don't you, if, um, if Swella Braverman, and Pretty Patel before her, but, you know, the focus is Braverman here, if, if these Home Secretaries were focused on national security instead of stoking culture wars and blowing a load of money on, on nothing, then might we not have better cyber defences as well? So actually, I think, you, I think if we had a Home Secretary that was really serious about cyber defence and they were doing everything they could and one happened anyway because you can't stop everything, um, then you would say, well, you know, they are trying their best. They'll have to learn lessons and, and keep improving the system. But when you've got a Home Secretary who is who herself has been a security risk, uh, a liability, and who has shown no interest in actually attending to the security of the nation, then actually I think we can put that cyber attack down to her as well, because the Home Office is clearly dysfunctional. But anyway, um, oh, someone's just saying there, there's a report that three asylum seekers on board have reported as being unwell. Uh, hadn't actually caught up with that. Obviously, it can take some time um, for Legionnaire's disease to, ma to manifest. We, I mean, it's like you, you wait a couple of weeks really to see what the, the impact is. But we do know, of course, that there were dozens of people on board and that they had used the water. So, um, I mean, if anyone becomes seriously ill as a result of this, Bra it's absolutely ridiculous that Braverman's still in post. The, the, the only reason she can possibly still be in post is because she's still that Rishi Sunak is still too weak to get rid of her because it's not even like she's an asset to the Tories on the culture wars. She's not. She's a bungler. It's not just that she's doing things that aren't in the public interest. There's lots of ministers not doing anything in the public interest. She's actually bungling things. She's not even achieving the aim she wants to achieve. Uh, does my T-shirt in the graphic designer who bought the property in Italy in Fipoli say, am I childish? Yes. And the answer, of course, is yes. Um, disorganised home service. They want immigrants on the prison hall more than they wanted them to be safe. But even the, the prison hall, I mean, that's a good thing. So this barge, I mean, let's, let's consider this barge. So it's supposed to be used, used for like North Sea oil workers and stuff like that. And it wasn't considered great for them. They didn't like it. But it's supposed to accommodate 220 people. The Home Office wants it to accommodate at least five, I think it might be 550, but at least 500 people, which is straight away well over double what it was designed for. And apparently the design has not met the approval of people who were using it as designed. Um, so and that is why the Fire Brigade Union said this is not safe. You cannot... You know, it's like they were actually saying it's dodgy enough if you used it for 220 people. They said, actually, you know, it's, it's not from a fire safety point of view, it's not great. Um, but jamming 500 odd people on, it's like, no, absolute madness. Absolutely. You couldn't evacuate people in the event of a fire. Um, and and now, of course, you know, there's, there's this other safety issue, which is an utterly ridiculous one. But they just desperately wanted the headlines. They... And th but this is how the Tories are, isn't it? This is why, for example, they allowed the NHS to collapse. There are some Conservatives who recognise that the NHS is a good thing, but 
they think to them, but they still get driven by this efficiency thing. Oh, I need it to be efficient, efficient. Can't have nurses just sitting idle all day or something like that. And you think, so what they do is they they fund the capacity to, to meet the normal capacity needs without realising that then in winter it gets overloaded. And it's not able to, they think, oh, we'll just clear the backlog in summer. Well, that doesn't, well, first of all, you're leaving people to be ill and injured for longer than necessary by doing that. But it doesn't clear that that's why the waiting list can't go on. It's the same thing here, isn't it? It's the same optimistic attitude that only people from these backgrounds could have. Oh, we've tested for the thing, but it'll come back clear. Of course it'll come back clear. Why would they think it would come back clear? If the water had been standing in that pipe for such a long time, there's a huge risk of it. Absolutely huge risk of it. Have I heard of the new nickname for 30p? Leenock Powell. No, I hadn't. That was a very good one. He is now catching up to Grant Shapps on the older aliases, isn't he? Uh, why hasn't Sunak sacked her yet? He must know what's going on, even from the USA. Of course he will. Uh, why doesn't he do something or has Mickey Mouse kept him from his phone? No, because he's too weak, isn't it? I, don't, I obviously don't know what's going on internally within the, the Tory party unless someone leaks it. Um, it's So if we go back to why Rishi Sunak appointed her in the first place, because even at the time it was a mad move, she'd just been sacked. And she'd just been sacked for good reason. It wasn't like a spiteful act from Liz Truss. She'd been sacked for basically compromising national security. You know, it was very serious. And she had basically ignored protocols. She wasn't being, like, careless. She specifically ignored protocols that she had been instructed in. Cause she, because she thought, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Uh, you know, you know, you need to, if you're going to send these files, they have to be secure. You have to check who you're sending them to. No, it'll be fine. Um, well, it's not fine. And but it's the same attitude here. Oh, well, we've tested for it, but it'll all we, we want to get them on. It'll all come back. Fine. It'll come back clear. And it hasn't. And it was probably not going to either. Not stagnant water in there, for goodness sake. But the reason why Sunak appointed her in the first place, I was, I was waffling on. Uh, was because she brought with her a certain amount of support from the right of the party, the, the, the far right. And um, so Sunak found her useful for that to try and prevent Boris Johnson winning. Now, in the event, Boris Johnson got the numbers anyway and he could have stood and he probably would have won. But Sunak was not to know that at the time. But even now, and you could think, well, now he is prime minister. They're not going to replace him. Can't he now sack her? I mean, clearly not, because if he could, surely he would have done. This is madness. Um, but it suggests to me that he's already pissed off some on the right anyway because of uh, watering down this EU retained law, the retained EU law bill. And he's now... So it's clear to me that... See, what I would have thought is the people on the far right would have looked at Swella Bravman and said, no, you can't. You can't be our champion because you're useless. You're utterly useless. But they haven't. They still see her as their vehicle to get what they want. It's madness uh, because she's not. She's utterly incompetent. You know, we've, we've seen in recent years what happens when you back an ideologue to be the vehicle to get what you want. I mean, the last case was Liz Truss. You know, the far right backed her because she was going to deliver this low tax utopia. And she was up for it. Absolutely up for it. But politically unsustainable. She, she, she completely mishandled it. And the same thing will happen with Braverman. But anyway, uh, given that the accommodation is significantly overcrowded, should the occupants apply to their local council for new accommodation under the homelessness criteria? Unfortunately, as asylum seekers, they can't really access local services. Um, when you convert the £1.6 billion pounds to the price per night per room for, say, a 1,000 rooms for two years, it's £2,100 per night per room. Yeah, everything, when the Conservatives spend money on anything, it's always way over the odds. It's funny, isn't it? We're supposed to have various groups who monitor um, value for public money. But the government just ignore them because none of this is value for public money. 
One, I think the one, now I don't want to talk too much, you know, the 1.6 billion pound, I don't think it was for like hiring one barge. I think it was, because remember we hired three. I think it was actually the total cost. So we, were, we actually had hired three, but remember we've only got one because two of them got turned away. So one was supposed to, so we've got the one in Dorset, the plague ship. One was supposed to go to Liverpool, but Liverpool told them to bog off. One was supposed to go to Edinburgh, but Edinburgh told them to bog off. So they had to turn back. So they've gone. They came to Britain, found out. I mean, how, how did Braverman even let them get here? The journey was on its way. She would have been contacted. Oh, these barges are on the way. Spiffing. Well done. Like, she hadn't actually arranged for a berth for them. She hadn't. She's that incompetent. She didn't even arrange for somewhere for them to dock on an island, a bloody island. She just looked at it, like someone looked at it and went, well, we could, we could berth one at Dorset, one at Liverpool, one at Edinburgh. And she went, great, let's do that, without actually checking with those authorities that they would accept them. And only one of them did. Uh, if Braverman does not become Tory leader after the general election, I can't see her staying silent on the back benches. Should be a thorn in the leadership side. Well, so it'd be quite interesting, won't it? So, so if she doesn't, I, I quite agree, by the way. I mean, she was she was gobby enough last year when she was the Home Secretary. She was mouthing off at the Tory party conference when Liz Truss was the leader. Uh, I wonder if she'll do the same again. Uh, I wonder if she'll get the same reaction because at that time, she'd only been Home Secretary for a few weeks. So she hadn't actually had a chance to cock anything up yet. Any cock-ups were basically down to Pretty Patel. So this year, it'd be very different. She'll have been Home Secretary for just over a year. And there'll be many cock-ups on her record. So we'll have to see. I don't even know. Um, oh, hang on. Can I check? Let me. I was just going to say, I don't really know how Conservative, like the, the Conservative Party members would view her. But we could have a look, couldn't we, at the Cabinet rankings on Conservative Home. Where's the latest? Is there an August one? Um, here we go. Here's the latest one. Let's have a look where Braverman is. I haven't checked this out yet. Um, I mean, she's not at the top, but she's not too far down. She has a more, and this is, so this is Conservative Home. So they basically use a panel of known Conservative members we don't know how representative of it is, but they're likely to, of course, be quite active Conservative members. And she has a plus 32.2%, uh, oh, sorry, plus 32.2 approval rating. Well, it is a percent, really, isn't it? Um, yeah, GC saying, I think it was the contract fee for the lot. Yeah, I do as well. But nonetheless, we've still spent £1.6 billion pounds and we've got one barge. And, you know... It really is only fit for a common, well, if it's fit at all for anything, for 220 people. They're trying to use it for 500 odd. We had about 750 asylum seekers arrive the other day in one day. So, you know, um, and we've had about 50. I mean, we get, what is it? Something like about 20,000 a year it can be a bit more, 20, 30,000 a year asylum seekers. Why are we spending £1.6 billion on a, even three barges? But, but one barge is what we've got out of it. Uh, do I think Starmer will give uh, clear answers when he becomes PM uh, PMQs? He'd better not. The, no, because um, here's the thing, and I'll tell, I'll tell you why. It, it's not, a, you know, oh, we should have a prime minister that answers the questions properly. There's two types of question you are asked at PMQs. The first is by someone on your side who wants, who, who basically, you've probably even given them the question to ask, but they want to draw attention to something good that the government's doing, right? So obviously you answer those. Every other question is from a political opponent. Hopefully not on your own side, but sometimes it is. But they are certainly from political opponents. They're trying to trip you up. So, of course, you do not give clear answers because the question is designed to make you look ridiculous if you do give a clear answer. No, I hope he doesn't. But, I, but there is a difference. There is a difference between um, giving a sort of more flowery answer or moving it to 
the sort of a, a focus that you would like to place on it and just not answering the question. So I'll tell you what I do hope happens. If he's asked a question, for example, on asylum, uh, the asylum backlog, at some point he'll be asked about the asylum backlog, right? Should he give um, a frank answer about that one? Yes, he should. He should be able to say what's happening and what the progress is. But here's the thing. So no Tory MP will ask him about the asylum backlog if it's going down. So again, it's like one of those things, isn't it? It's like there'll be certain questions he'll be more than happy to answer. The Tories won't ask him those unless they're really stupid. But as I say, there is a difference between being a, a, a bit clever with the answer you give and just not answering the question. Will Braverman keep her seat in the next election? Yeah, it's a really safe seat. There was some doubt because her constituents is disappearing. And so she had to stand against another Conservative MP to get the to become the candidate for the new seat. Uh, it was thought that the other person, I've forgotten her name now, it'll come to me. Well, it might, probably won't come to me, but I, I would know it if someone said. Uh, it was suggested that the other one might, even though she was just an unknown backbencher, that she might win because she's more in tune with those sort of conservatives in that sort of region. Um, whereas they're not all that impressed with culture wars. But no, Braverman's seniority obviously swung it. So she, yeah, she now, because otherwise she'd have had to try and find a seat somewhere else and it might not have been so safe. Uh, but now, yeah, she, she, she will keep her seat. It would be quite remarkable if she did not. It's like one of the safest seats. Uh, what was the problem with Abbott's comments? Was it just that it's better for Labour to keep quiet and let the Tories dig their own hole? No, it's basically um, using tragic deaths when they'd immediately happened in like what was really a crap joke. Um, like if she'd have drawn attention to it and said, you know, people have died, the, you know, people, if she'd, if she'd have basically tried to explain to Lee Anderson, people are making dangerous crossings, you know, you're, you're having a pop at them. This proves that they are dangerous. They're risking their lives, right? Whatever you think they're coming here for, they are risking their lives. They don't need this sort of behavior. But unfortunately, by, by making a crap joke about it, she's like using 41 deaths um, to make a, a really weak political point. That was what, I mean, and... and, and and it's the sort of thing that will, you know, it is offensive to do it like that. It, you need to be a bit cleverer as a politician. You know, the sort of joke you might say to your friends or something like that, that will be absolutely fine. You just know you don't in public. Um, they could build several housing estates for UK citizens. What, with £1.6 billion? Pounds? There's a lot they could build for £1.6 billion, pounds, yeah. Absolutely. See, they don't even need to spend £1.6 billion on, on houses. They just have to let councils build the bloody things. You know, this latest, like the, this latest, oh, the new Silicon Valley is going to be in Cambridge. Is it? Well, Cambridge Council are saying you're preventing them from being able to build the houses they need. Because Sunak's like, oh, houses, oh, yes, but our, our, our councillors don't like the new houses, you see. Really? Uh, Swella Braverman deserves to lose her seat. Let's hope she does lose it. Yeah, I'm, I, I really wouldn't hold your breath. For them, to, <laughs> for her to lose her seat. Do you know what? Let me let's just uh, let's just flag something up here. The latest on electoral calculus. Let's get rid of that. Where is it? Uh, is this, um, which is that the Conservatives? Are, oh, this won't happen. Remember, because there's that. Remember, we don't have a campaign at the moment. When you've got a campaign. Some people come out of the woodwork, but at the moment it would be suggesting the Conservatives would be on for winning 133 seats, right? That's a little over a third of their current number of seats. Braverman's would still be one of them. In order for Braverman to lose her seat, you'd actually have to end up at that low prediction of them only ending up with 49 seats or something. Could you imagine that if there was a scenario where if you look here, the low seats for the Tories and the high for the Lib Dems is both on 49. What would happen? So let us imagine if Labour won whatever they won and the Tories were on 49 seats, the Lib Dems were on 49 seats, 
the SNP were on fewer than 49 seats. I don't actually know who would be the official leader of the opposition because in that scenario, you've got two parties who have exactly the same number of seats. In fact, you could have a really weird situation. Like For all I know, because we've got some mad rules in Parliament, you know, they go back hundreds of years. There could be some mad rule where you flip a coin for it because that happens in elections. If there's a dead heat in an election, you have a recount if it's a tight vote, but if it comes back, it's like, yeah, it's exact same number of votes. You, you either flip a coin or draw lots. The, the returning officer decides by what random act the MP is chosen, but it's random. Um, what if it's the same thing? If, if, the, if the Liberal Democrats and the Tories have got the same number of seats, do you just flip a coin? Do you have a cage match? No, we probably shouldn't have a cage match. Rishi Sunak probably would. Do you think against Ed Davey? No, it's, no. Maybe flip a coin. Much more gentlemanly. Or pistols at dawn. But either way, what if, so what if you had a situation? So let's say the Tories won the coin flip, right? Um, and so Rishi Sunak is leader of the opposition until his successor's chosen. And then let's say that a Conservative MP resigned. So all of a sudden, they've got one seat fewer. Does like Ed Davey then become the leader of the opposition because he's now the bigger party? And then what if the Tories win their by-election again? Does it revert back or do they have to have another toy coin toss? It will be very weird. I don't think it will happen. So I don't, I don't think we need to spend too much time worrying about it. But that would be quite interesting. Uh, one pet angry pagan saying there, the Tories are crumbling so bad that Labour just need to wait and find the right spot and push. The, well, at the moment, they've not really got much choice. Like when Parliament's in session, that is the time. So PMQs. I mean, if, if, <laughs> if we had a PM, if, if Parliament was in session at the moment, next week's PMQs, I think, would be, unless they managed to engineer another bigger cock up, would be quite predictable. It wouldn't just be the barge, by the way. It would be the break in in Kent with the, the theft of that hard drive and the aviation fuel. And also the cyber attack on the foreign... Because, seriously, Keir Starmer could put an awful lot of pressure on Swella Bravo and you think to yourself, well, what's the benefit of that? Without calling for her to resign, but calling on Rishi Sunak to... I, I would put the focus on the, on the Home Office and the Home Secretary's role in it. Because Keir, the last thing Keir Starmer wants is for Swella Bravman to be sacked. That's why I think it's mad that the Tories... Whoever is stopping Sunak from sacking her must be mad absolutely mad because i guarantee sonna uh, starmer does not want her sacking because she's an incredible asset at the moment i think that is because i've heard a couple of people say well why aren't labor calling her for to resign it's like well first of all you can't just keep calling like the problem is there are so many incompetent cabinet ministers you could be calling for a different one to resign every week and you'll just look ridiculous it'll it'll look like just political games because the Tories will say oh you're just just playing silly political games this is serious will you be serious it'll actually look silly if they keep calling for someone to resign every week but um but I think specifically with Braverman they don't they don't you know they're quite happy they'll they'll obviously have to point out her appalling conduct and I'm sure they're not happy about the damage she is doing to the home office because Yvette Cooper's got to come it's the same home office when she becomes home secretary She's going to have to deal with it. She's going to have to reform it. Um, but anyway, is SB obnoxious enough for her seat to be at risk? It's so, no, it's really so safe a seat. It'd be lovely to think of it. It'd be lovely to think so. But the thing is, like, in a by-election, you could argue there's almost no such thing as a safe seat. But in a general election, lay, like, if you take... The by-elections. Let's take Selby and Ainsley, for example, where Labour should never have been able to win that, but they did. And, you know, several by several thousand votes. But what was happening? They had loads of their top team going campaigning. They had activists from all over, all over campaigning. But for the general election, activists will be campaigning in their own seat. The only way you'll get activists from another area to campaign for you is if their seats are non-starter. Because obviously there'll be some seats, it's like, well, it's not worth us campaigning. We may as well go and campaign in a winnable seat. And that'll be the situation in Braverman's seat. I can't remember exactly where it is. It may be surrounded by Tory but 
the labor activists in that area, if they've got any sense, will just find a marginal, the closest marginal to them and go and help there instead. There'd be no point in fighting for it. So it's, it's not, you know, you could, it's one of the, yeah, you could look at it and you could think maybe if Labour really threw the kitchen sink at it, they might be able to get something, but it'd be a waste of resources. So you'd focus it where you can. And as I say, even in that area, the actual local Labour activists probably shouldn't, whether they will or not, I don't know, but they probably shouldn't spend much, if any, time campaigning. Do a bit of leafleting if you want, why not? Because... You're going to have a candidate, um, spend a bit of money on leaflets, do some leafleting, knock on a few doors now and then if you fancy getting a bit of exercise. But mostly if you've got time, go and help someone else out who could actually win. Um, uh, James saying there, the only positive with first past the post is jeopardy of losing your seat. If you have PR, because you have multiple members, you could have those you wanted elected. Uh, you put Sunak in Yorkshire Regional Bravo in South East. Ah, no, there is a way. PR doesn't guarantee that. In fact, the form of PR that I favour wouldn't allow for that. So in my, because there are different versions of PR, and in, in honesty, I'm not all that precious about it. I will accept any full form of PR. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to quibble. Um, but if I were in charge of it and it was like, Phil, come up with a system, will you? I mean, it won't be me coming up with a system. These systems exist. But the one I favour would be, so you go into your, your polling station, right? And the ballot card has like two sections. The first section is basically who you're voting for. And there's a list of all the parties taking place, plus the names of the independent candidates, because you can still vote for independents this way. So in my case, uh, let's say, on, well, uh, so I would vote Labour. I'd tick the Labour Party box. So my vote's going to Labour. Right? That's all there is to it. But then there'd be another section which has the list of candidates for the parties. So if you voted for a party that you then put a tick, so let's say it's an area with like eight candidates, right? So Labour have got eight candidates there. You tick the candidate you want. So then let's say in that region, Labour win three seats, right? They get enough votes for three MPs. The MPs chosen don't have to be the list that the Labour Party supplied in that order. It could be based on who got the most votes. So everyone voting Labour would have the choice of voting for a candidate. And the, the three candidates who got the most votes would be those. So you wouldn't actually, you can have a system where the party can decide the order of, of candidates winning, but you don't have to. You know, there's lots of different forms of PR. So you could absolutely stop uh, a candidate being safe. Now, what I will say is this. When... I say when, I'm being optimistic. Uh, when or if PR happens, I strongly suspect that the political parties will want to decide the order of candidates. They'll want that control. So I strongly suspect we will end up with a version which, as you say, would allow the party to basically guarantee someone a seat um, but it is not necessary. It is not necessary. Uh, Starmer won't start on Bravman until the election year starts and it's too late to replace her. Well, he doesn't have to start on Bravman. Like, so, for example, it doesn't really do him much good to start on Bravman or to have a, a pop at Bravman. He wants to have a pop at Sunak. But to do that, he needs to attack the Home Office as well. So what he needs, the way I would phrase it, if I were him, is I would be attacking the incompetence of the Home Office rather than the Home Secretary. I'd be attacking the competence of the Home Office because all of these are Home Office issues. I wouldn't bother saying which individual is responsible. It's a Home Office issue. And then ask Sunak what he's doing about it because there's a dysfunctional government department. He's the head of government. What is he doing about it? That's what I do. Put the onus on Sunak. Always put the onus on the leader. It's, uh, you know, because the problem with putting the onus on um, an individual cabinet member is twofold. First of all, um, when people go to the polls, they have the leaders in mind, not cabinet ministers, because they can be changed. And secondly, they can be changed. So before the election, Sunak could find that he can get rid of Bravman, at which point, if Starmer's invested a load of time attacking Bravman personally, 
It's all wasted. All wasted. So, but Sunak will still be there. Or put it this way, if the Tory MPs think that it will actually be better for them to have another cracker, another leader, then my goodness me. Who will give us the big Portillo moment? I mean, I, I just think it's going to be a completely different kettle of fish. It really is. Um, the, the loss, I mean, it was a bad loss for the Conservatives in 1997. At the moment, I think it will be much worse. See, although this says at the moment, you know, predicted 133 seats, and we don't know what twists and turns are going to happen before the election itself. And, and I keep saying, remember, the one thing that polling cannot take account of very easily, and doesn't really attempt to, is this, this bedrock of Conservative voters who are at the moment saying they, who at the moment are not saying they'll vote Conservative. They're saying don't know. Now, these aren't people who won't vote. They probably will. Hopefully, some of them will stay at home. You know, voter apathy. It might be that a lot of these people will go, well, I won't support Labour, but I won't support the Conservatives. Um, but there will be some who turn up and vote Conservative. And it could be a significant number. So I don't expect it to be as bad as this 133 seats at the moment. But it could be. It could be. But I, I'll tell you what, I, I can absolutely see it being below 200 seats. I can see it being significantly below 200 seats. Because I keep looking. I mean, you look at the various, when you're trying to sort of work out how the Tories are going to do, you look at the various pieces of the puzzle. First of all, they're pursuing very ill-advised strategies. Their culture wars are failing. They, they probably never should have tried in the first place. It's not even hindsight. But in hindsight, they're not working. They, the, the public wants the government to, to talk about the economy and healthcare, And they're not doing. And they, although there's a lot of conservative voters do care about immigration and the focus is always on asylum, the conservatives would do far better by just fixing the problem. Fix the problem. What are they going to look like when they lose and Labour just fix the problem? What are they going to look like? Because Labour can... I mean, when people will say things like, oh, yeah, but complex problems, there's no easy solution. No, indeed. But the, the mess that the Conservatives are making of it is so bad that Labour will get a lot of very quick, easy wins just by processing the claims. In fact, Labour will be able to get into the news that they're deporting failed asylum seekers. They can say that, that Keir Starmer at the dispatch box, I mean, some people in Labour may not want him to say this, but he can say, we are the party that are actually deporting illegal immigrants. Because if someone's failed their asylum claim, that is what they are. And they are deemed to be an illegal immigrant at that point. They're not an illegal immigrant when they're applying for asylum. They are deemed to be illegal immigrants only when they failed. And... And then they can be deported and Labour can say, they, Labour can say, we've deported this many illegal immigrants. You deported none of them. You just spent a fortune. And they can say, they can compare the costs. If I was like Yvette Cooper, but maybe it's Keir Starmer, if he wants to really you know, make a big deal of it, he can say, it cost us X amount to deport this. You know, it cost us this amount to deport this number of illegal immigrants. And it cost you this amount to deport this number of illegal immigrants. You know, he can say that. They're setting him up. The, the Tories are not only getting their strategy so badly wrong that it's going to mean they lose the election badly. They're making sure that they lose the next election really badly as well by giving Labour lots of easy wins on the areas that their voters care about, like Conservative voters, immigration. Late, well, by keeping the focus on asylum, because I expect economic migration to go up, but by keeping the focus on asylum... Labour can get easy wins. Economy, easy wins. Even though the economy is going to be like in a hole, it's, it's a deeper hole than needs be the case. And as for healthcare, I mean, behave. You know, the backlog will be, and we won't race down, but it will be coming down significantly. I, I, I can't, you know, so you look at a, a number like this and you think, well, it'll probably go up because there's a pool of, undecided Tory voters out there and you know 
and and there isn't an, you know people are being asked to say who they would vote for when there's no election but when you're in an election campaign all of a sudden people sort of it sharpens their thinking because at the moment people can you know it's like oh i've just voted so and they just do it off the top of their head and um but in an election campaign they'll think about it more because they'll imagine themselves doing it because they know it's only a few weeks away um so you can see this going up but then you can also you just look at everything and then you look at the fact the mortgage crisis will be worse um the cost of living crisis in general will be worse inflation may be lower well it will be lower but the cost of living crisis won't be any better oh it's there's there's nothing there's nothing on the horizon for them unless of course ukraine win a uh, military victory in ukraine next before the election and even then are they really gonna is it really gonna make people suddenly vote for them uh, is there any chance there's some kind of double bluff that's setting labor up for a fail please tell me there isn't i don't even imagine how that would work now the tories are not going to six months before the election suddenly start governing properly and if they did it would be too late wouldn't it uh, could labor safeguard their reforms by implementing a law that required a super majority of two-thirds of mps to repeal any act of parliament no and that would be utterly ridiculous you couldn't do that now. Uh, that would be a huge constitutional change an absolute madness and also it would prevent them repealing Tory laws. Remember, Labour will want to, I, I'm guessing, amend or repeal quite a lot of laws. They won't be able to. I mean, ha, you, you don't stop yourself being able to amend laws. What if Labour in a future election ended up with a majority, but only just not? They didn't have two thirds of the MPs. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to amend any laws themselves. Now, it'd be a constitutional outrage doing something like that. It'd be totally undemocratic. And, uh, you know, super majorities are fine for major constitutional changes. Um, but this would be a case of getting a bare majority to vote for a major constitutional change, which stopped uh, a simple majority amending laws, which is un unworkable. Uh, it would screw the government as much as anyone. No, the way to safeguard their reforms is proportional representation. If anyone's got, got a better idea, I'm, I'm all ears, but that... It's really this simple. The Conservatives aren't going to go away. Like people are saying again, aren't they? Oh, this might be an existential threat to the Tory party. And it's it's not. It's not. Uh, people said that in 97. It wasn't. And they go, oh, yeah, but they're really mad this time. Yeah, they are. But they'll get rid of the maddens. As soon as they're losing enough elections, they'll get rid of them. The reason why the Tories, Labour can fail. Labour can face existential threats easily. Conservatives can't. And the reason is simple. If you think about a billionaire, right? You think about particularly a very, very wealthy billionaire, you know, not just someone who's got a, me a measly billion, someone who's got like 50 billion or more, right? So a slight change to the tax rules or some other policy can make you a fortune, okay? So it's worth your while if you're incredibly wealthy donating to the party that will bring those changes in the conservatives will always have because they are the only party of billionaires so the billionaires will always fund them because what's like in this country in america you have to spend a lot of money in this country three million pounds is a large donation five million pounds is like massive almost unheard of like every now and then someone donates five million pounds it's like what what the hell where did that come from? Hardly, like, you know, hardly ever. And yet, to a billionaire who might, as a result of a, a change in some tax law, might save £50 million a year, what's a £5 million donation? Nothing. So um, the Tories will always be there. They will always be appealing. They'll always have the media on their side unless we can reform that. And it's, it's, the thing is, we should reform the media, but it's way easier to reform Parliament than the media. Way easier. Labour could reform Parliament quite easily. Next, Parliament. 16, 17 year olds to vote. Settled EU citizens. Um, there's some right-wingers complaining, well, what about people around the rest of the country? Okay, not EU citizens, everyone. Anyone who's got full settlement rights in this country can vote in general elections. How about that? 
How about that? Don't have to be just EU citizens, can be anyone. It's already Commonwealth citizens anyway. I mean, what's the, what the hell? You know, if you think about people who are settled in the UK, where are most from? Um, you know, a, a fair number from Commonwealth countries and a lot from Europe. I mean, you've got Americans and Chinese and, and so on as well. But I would think that the bulk are from Europe or, or Commonwealth countries. Commonwealth citizens can already vote in general elections. They don't have to be UK citizens. They don't even need dual nationality. In fact, they don't even need full settlement rights. They just need to be domiciled here, basically. Um, whereas for EU citizens, Labour only proposing full, you know, full settlement. But although we don't have the details yet. But do that. That already reforms it because you change the electorate. That's millions of people who, who aren't exactly Tories by and large. Then following Parliament, proportional representation. Let's make it happen. Proportional representation. Uh, is a referendum democratic? It's only democratic if it's true, as in if people are not deceived in it. That's the only way. Democracy isn't really democracy if, you're, if people think they're voting for one thing, it's another. Like, imagine a form of democracy, right, where um, you gave someone a ballot paper and there were a load of boxes on it. Like, let's say there were five candidates and there were five boxes on it but there were no names and you got them to, but there was a master for the people who did the counting, they knew which box was which candidate, but you were voting for it. Didn't. So if people fill in that ballot paper, would that be democratic? No, it wouldn't. People are voting. That's essentially what democracy is, but they wouldn't know what they're voting for. So it's not democratic. So if people think they're voting for one thing and they're not because someone's lied to them, that's not democratic. Uh, how much actual damage do I see the Tories doing before the next election? Mm. It's hard to, to say anything other than immense damage because, for example, they're going to, there may be a tipping point. I get the impression at the moment the only reason we're not seeing a real proper exodus from the NHS is that sort of belief that Labour are coming in. I think that might be the only thing holding it together. I think if, and we still could see a, still a lot of people leaving the NHS and we're not going to see much influx. There's still going to be a net number of, of, of people leaving the NHS because they cannot afford the cost of living and getting jobs somewhere else, which is what the Tories want, by the way. So the NHS really will be in trouble. Labour will come in. The NHS will be badly understaffed and it will be... We are, uncom we are offering uncompetitive wages. They are uncompetitive. And I don't just mean you might be thinking, oh, Australia are targeting like British medics. Ireland, Ireland are paying higher wages for doctors and I presume nurses as well. But I saw an advert, uh, someone pointed me to an advert um, a few weeks ago. Ireland are paying more for doctors. They're, they're trying to recruit doctors. So even if you've got someone who wants to go to an English-speaking country in Europe, Ireland pays more. And they don't have clowns in charge of their government. Um, so the, in terms of the NHS, a great deal of damage. In terms of the economy, it might actually ironically be more muted because if the global economy carries on recovering, assuming the space monkeys don't attack, assuming we actually just have a bit of a normal period of time globally, then that is hopeful because even if our economy is still stagnant, if the global economy is picking up, that means more potential customers if we can then um, take lowering trade barriers more seriously. Because when it comes to boosting your own economy, we, you sort of need other people's economies to be doing well as well to be able to afford your goods and services. Um, in terms of anything else, I mean, legislation, draconian legislation, yes. My major worry is the online harms bill. I think that's a bit of a worry of mine. Am I getting that one right? There's too many bills around. It is. It's the online harms bill I'm thinking of, isn't it? Um, that could do a lot of unintentional damage. I don't think the Tories are trying to break the internet. But they could, uh, just because they don't listen. They don't listen. I mean, look what happened with the Bibby Stockholm. 
Uh, oh, we need to test for Legionnaire's disease. All right, you do that then. Uh, oh, we also need to wait for the results to come back. Oh yeah, we're not doing that. They don't listen. They do get told things. They get told things, but they don't listen. Um, there must have been another comment I've missed. It says, in 2019, the toys were imploded, but Labour also imploded. Yes. I mean, this is the thing. Whenever someone, like, 2019 was the proof that you cannot just wait for the Conservatives to implode and walk over the ashes and, and seize power. Because the polling in sort of um, round about May, April, sort of after the local elections, April, May 2019, the Tory polling was absolutely catastrophic. Catastrophic. Well, basically as bad as it is now, actually. Um, but Labour's was not benefiting. Labour was also down there. In fact, we had the really weird situation where in the polls, the Liberal Democrats and the Brexit Party were... All four parties had roughly 25% of voting intention or, or close to it. But the Liberal Democrats and the Brexit Party were ahead of both Labour and the Conservatives. You were looking at, if we'd have had a general election the next day, a really mad situation. So... Um, Yes, 2019 proved for it. Before then, you could you would probably just say no. It's not. It doesn't follow that just because uh, the one of the major two parties uh, collapses in support that the other one will gain. Uh, it's not always the case at all. You still have to win those votes. But 2019 just proved it. Uh, does this quiet period, or during this quiet period, Labour should be promoting future policies? I agree. Uh, New Deal for working people would be an ideal proposal to push. Just before the Tories remove workers' rights, why aren't they? Well, OK, I completely agree that Labour should be pushing. They should be carrying out some major policy speeches, right? Absolutely should be doing that because it will get reported on. Um, now, whether it's the workers' rights, I think... See, interestingly, uh, Liz Webster, I think it is, she, she um, lobbies on behalf of farming. She's very anti-Brexit. And... Um, she was suggesting that Labour should actually make an issue of food. Now, you would think, you would say, she will say that, of course, because that's her focus. But I actually think she could be right, because cost of, when we talk about cost of living crisis, there are several things that are particularly noteworthy for people. And one of them is food, the cost of food. Because apart from anything else, when you're struggling with the cost of living, what is the first thing, or one of the first things, where you're likely to change your behaviour? The food you buy. You may go for cheaper brands, you may go for different food altogether. So you are having your standard of living reduced in that way. So by Labour focusing on um, poorer food security, the fact we're not growing as much in this country now, and that we could do if the government let farmers hire the um, farm labourers, um, I actually think that could be a good one. Because that is in people's minds. Food is in everyone's minds. Um, I saw something about GTA 6 having an age recognition thing. Face scan to see if you look like an adult. To stop under 17's play and implications. Um, ah, I didn't know that. Uh, I don't play those sort of games. But, um, hmm... See, there are, like, obviously with games, there are classifications. On the one hand, the technology used as is just purely to uh, tell if someone is likely to be under the age. The problem there is you can have someone who actually looks that age. I knew someone. I, I actually was with them one time when they were trying to buy a bottle of whiskey. They were 30 years old, by the way, and they got ID'd. 30 years old. Um, so then you say, so how accurate is it going to be really? And then the other thing is, what if the technology is used for more than that? How are we to know, for example, that, because this must mean you need a webcam active when you're playing the game, doesn't it? Um, so that must mean, you know, it's like, it's one of those things like, well, if, it, if it's active to do that one thing, are we really confident in, in government regulation that it's not used to do other things. I suppose there'd be an element of that in it. 
Do you know what? I would just, my personal view, and this is as someone who's played computer games since he was four and hasn't turned into a violent person even though I play violent games, because they're just like fantasy violence, I don't really think it's that big a deal. I don't think anyone has seriously found any link between people playing games and turns in. In fact, if anything, it placates you. When, uh, if you've got rioting in the streets or you've got petty crime because, because youngsters are bored, right? And, and going out and causing criminal damage or something like that. They're not gamers. I'll tell you where gamers are. They're in their room, sat in front of a monitor. You know, so I'm I'm a big supporter of. Um, it's not healthy to play as much as some people will, even myself. But I would just say the best thing for an under seventeen, if uh, you know, would would be in front of a, a gaming monitor. Because no one, no one who's into gaming, goes out committing petty acts of of theft or d criminal damage. They don't go out rioting and looting. Why would they? They've got they've got something to do at home. But anyway, I you know it's it's an odd one to me. It's it's almost like I don't see how it can be that accurate. And it's like a lot of effort for I don't really know what the gain is. I can appreciate some games have classifications, age classifications. Is it that big a deal? Shouldn't the parents be exercising that control anyway? There's plenty of parental controls on on you know. Shouldn't the parents be dealing with that? But anyway, uh, it's not just the NHS where staff are hanging on for Labour governments, all the public sector. Media never mentions that those who are striking the ones who want to save the NHS, etc. No, but what I would say is I, I strongly suspect it would be way harder to repopulate NHS staff than others. Um, I mean, if I go from my own profession, for example, teaching, you can basically hire a teacher from wherever and introduce them to the school. And as long as they are actual qualified teacher, they can get on with it, you know, because they do their own thing. Whereas you know, inductions are much more important for NHS staff where you've got completely new systems to deal with and all the rest of it. Because you treat, like, you're only spending so much time even treating people using the systems as well for which you need training and i just think it would it would it would be much more difficult to do that there will be other things i mean there'll be parts of the civil service where the same applies as well i suppose but for a lot of professions i think um you know policing the main thing with policing is that are they experienced police officers the actual training them in the use of systems yes that exists but mostly it's like are they experienced police officers if you were to get them from an experienced police officer say from i don't know france or ireland or something like that would still be an experienced police officer same with a teacher but any you know doctor yeah but you know you've got to teach them how to use the nhs systems as well but anyway uh, playing violent video games actually decreases likelihood of violent crime see i've not any i've not seen any reports that will say one way or the other what i do know is I know lots of people who play these games. I am one of them, and I don't play the ultraviolet ones. But I, you know, it's um, I've never known anyone who was like an angry person. I've never seen anything like that. Now, obviously, I've only got my own experiences. I'm not going to suggest my limited experience can be extrapolated. But I've never really seen a serious report that said, "Oh, yeah, this is a thing." Um, uh, it's a tired trope to beat up young people. Yes, that is exactly what it is, Louise, precisely. Uh, blaming young people. But I th it's an absolute madness. Whenever, they, whenever you hear about any sort of youth crime, like delinquent, delinquency, and they go, oh, it's the computer games, you know, I say, I absolutely guarantee it is not. If they had computer games, they would be at home playing the computer games. I'm going to go and play a computer game after this. I'm going to do something else first, but I am I'm going to be playing some World of Warcraft. Thank you very much. I'm not going to go out afterwards and rob a bank. They're not open anyway. I ain't got any banks near me anyway. But anyway, um, think studies showed games were beneficial, not harmful. Doesn't stop crazies from also playing and doing crazy things. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, Bravik, for example, 
Uh, he played World of Warcraft. Oh, it was the World of Warcraft that did it. No, it wasn't. If it was World of Warcraft that influenced him, he wouldn't have killed anyone. He'd have stood there trying to cast a frostbolt and got nowhere. It was being allowed guns that allowed him to kill a load of people. Uh, so do things look good for people who want leftist policies in the mid to long term then? Yes. It, as long, it depends on, um, on how much you're willing to compromise. Uh, there will be policies that, so there'll be three types. There'll be policies that we approve of. There will be policies that we don't approve of, but we maybe accept are necessary in order to retain public confidence. And there are policies that will be bad policies. It is utterly ridiculous to suggest that Labour will not enact any, any knee-jerk bad policies. They will. They did last time. They will this time. I don't think Starmer's, uh, you know, a genius. Well, I do think he's probably quite clever. But I don't think he's like a political guru or anything. I think he's getting things wrong at the moment. I don't think he's getting much wrong. I think it'd be mad to say he's getting much wrong. But I think he's getting some things wrong. So inevitably... I will think he's going to get some things wrong in government. I think he will adopt some policies that are bad policies and that he will realise are bad policies that he thinks he will be doing because it's getting voters on side. And it'll be the sort of thing that come the election, voters really don't care one, one way or the other. Um, so we will see. What games do I play? Uh, mostly MMOs. So like World of Warcraft, Elder Scrolls Online, Star Wars The Old Republic. Um, Lord of the Rings Online, but unfortunately you have to... It's not, you can't just pick it up. The other three you can just pick up as and when. That one you can't. So, but there you go. Uh, the video game thing is it's cathartic, yes. Um, although, as my partner points out, I get very sweary on it. Because on World of Warcraft, I do quite a lot of the casual group content. There's a lot of idiots. And I don't suffer falls gladly. So, there's a lot of F-bombs get dropped when I'm playing. Uh, but never mind. It's only the same as driving. Uh, it's it's a good pressure valve. But there we are, run out of time. We're certainly not going to turn this into a gaming stream. I used to do gaming streams, but not anymore. Uh, but whether or not, last comment here, whether or not games cause violent behaviour is a research field full of absolutely ridiculous studies. Yeah, Yes, it needs to be done more seriously if it's going to be done at all. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is a ridiculous thing to suppose. Because, as I say, apart from anything else, it doesn't matter what sort of behavioural effect the game has on you. The point is, if you are into computer games, you don't want to go outside standing on a street corner, bugging old ladies. You don't want to go outside rioting. In fact, you don't like rioters. The power might go out. The power might go out. For goodness sake, could you imagine that in the middle of a dungeon group? My goodness me. But there we go. Uh, but there, there, thanks for coming on, everyone. Have a very good evening. And until next time, I'll see you later.